My name is Kara Megan Lewis, and I am one of the co-directors of Bridge Projects, which is a contemporary art gallery located in Hollywood, physically and conceptually located at the intersection of contemporary art, religious tradition, and spirituality. And um, this program, Jazz and the Gospel, that will be moderated by Daniel Walker, is a program that is birthed out of the exhibition Otherwise Revival that is visualizing the impact of the Black church and specifically the Black Pentecostal movement on arts and culture. And today's program will uh, test you specifically music and uh, design and arts practices. Um, the exhibition was co-curated between myself and Jasmine McNeil, who's going to be joining us uh, shortly. She's giving a tour to a group uh, from Hollywood, a, a church group here in, in Hollywood uh, called Ecclesia, who's taking a tour through the exhibition. So she'll be joining us shortly. Um, so this program did grow out of the knowledge and understanding that gospel and music of the black church was pouring that was pouring from the storefront churches here in Los Angeles in the early 20th century had an impact on jazz and blues artists such as Charles Mingus, Dizzy Gillespie, John Coltrane, among others. Um, so we're hoping that this important narrative um, that's shown through the artworks in the exhibition um, will just trace that lineage. Um, and this is a lineage that has been investigated widely by Daniel Walker, um, who's going to be moderating. Um, and I'll introduce him last so I can turn it over, but I did want to just um, introduce short, briefly each of the artists, specifically because I don't want to take too much time. But as I do that, Michael is going to be dropping a little bit more extended biography into the chat. Um, I, I kind of did these randomly. Artist Fulayemi Fo Wilson, um, hi Fo. <laughs> is an artist, curator, and writer, and educator based in Chicago, Illinois. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting her when I lived there through a residency program, and each work of hers that I experienced became a portal um, to another realm and a re-understanding of the history of the African diaspora as her work celebrates the Black imagination as technology of resistance and self-determination. In 2016, Fo founded the Enterprise Black House Studios with Norman T as a Chicago-based, socially focused, collaborative design studio dedicated to using design as an agent of change to uplift and transform marginal communities. Norman Teague, who I just mentioned, is the co was a co-founder of Black House Studios, is a Chica also Chicago-based designer and educator focused on projects, furniture, and object design, and educational models that challenge the systemic complexity of urbanism and the culture of communities. In a recent interview with Wallpaper Magazine, Norman was quoted, your world is a history that you read about, and if you're wrapping your head around things that really say that you don't belong here, then we have to create other books or we have to create another world. Norman's work in the studio and in the community and in collaboration with Fo Wilson is all about creating another kinder and more equitable world. Next we have Ashan Crawley, who knows all about creating other worlds and otherwise possibilities. Um, professionally, he is the professor of religious studies and African and Af um, African American and African studies at the University of Virginia. Um, like everyone else here in the discussion, he is a multi-hyphenate in that he makes work, he makes music, and he writes books. And his book, uh, The Black Pentecostal Breath, The Aesthetics of Possibilities, was inc incredibly influential on our curatorial inquiry of the exhibition. All of his work is um, kind of couched in or springing from, coming from this wellspring of the Black Pentecostal church experience in which he grew up elements of this experience that he believes, such as the tarrying and the music, the Hammond organ, all of these experiences that carry the congregation, hold the congregation into what he calls otherwise possibilities. Um, and his work, his uh, new book that he's working on uh, called Made Instrument is about the role of the Hammond organ in, in the institutional historic black church in Black sacred practice and in Black social life more broadly. And finally, of the artist, Dario Robleto is a transdisciplinary artist working in Houston, Texas. 
Um, I had the great pleasure of following his practice of making cabinet of curiosity type vitrines uh, for years um, by the galleries that showed him. Sumptuous vitrines of objects, shells, photos that celebrated the nuanced stories of human, animal, plant symbiosis and these shared histories. And so when Linnea and I saw his work as part of Prospect 4, I took note um, when we came across a music-centered installation in Prospect 4 where the music of gospel and blues singers and such such as Washington Phillips took center stage. And in a recent on-being interview with Krista Tippett, Robledo explained his connection to music in this way. For me to begin to talk about the sacred, I have to start with music. And it is with this listening ear that he's able to transport audiences through poetic some material and composition. Now, Daniel. <laughs> to introduce Daniel Walker. Um, Daniel Walker, as I mentioned, has a uh, scholarship in the myriad of interests. It lies at the intersection of entertainment, education, religion, community, empowerment. His interests are diverse from cultural resistance to institutional slavery in Havana and New Orleans to the impact of the AIDS crisis in Black communities in the 80s. We learned of his work and his interest in music through the exhibition, How Sweet the Sound, at California African American Museum that traced the roots of gospel music in Los Angeles. His resume and list of projects is vast and long, but of particular interest to otherwise revival is Walker's contribution to spearheading the Pentecostal and Charismatic Research Archive at USC. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Daniel Walker. Thank you. Hey, hey, well, 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 thank you very much for first that great introduction of all the panelists. For anyone who is who is uh, listening in and viewing on the Zoom, you are in for a treat today. I am personally uh, uh, overwhelmed by the talent and the perspectives of the people on the panel here today. And even though Kara gave a great introduction of everybody, I just want to once again reiterate today we have a uh, 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 Sean Crawley, a professor who will be giving us a little bit of his testimony. And I'm throwing this word out about testimony because I want each artist we can go through and we'll start with folk to really kind of give your testimony. And what I mean by your testimony is, you know, in a traditional church, in many cases, the notion has been that the church would open up in one of the kind of signature aspects of a Pentecostal and many times Baptist service was a testimonial and people were talking about, in essence, what they had gone through, what they had experienced. Some stories were of hope and other stories were of continued journeys and tragedy. Um, but I wanna start with being able to give each artist an opportunity to give me their testimony. And that testimony can be either this issue of the church in your work, the issue of your journey as an artist, but let's limit to about two minutes a piece, but let, let, let us hear your testimony. I wanna start with Fove Wilson first off of Black House in Chicago. Um, talk about your journey to either the work in this exhibit or your journey as an artist to the work that you do. Wow, what a question. But I wanna first thank um, Kara and Jasmine for the invitation to invite us and thank you all, I'm so happy to meet some of the other artists and thank you, Daniel. Um, I'm just so pleased to be in this space with you all. And um, yes, Lord. Uh, in terms of testimony, I think I'll talk about um, working with Norman and thinking about the work for the show. And when we were invited, Kara sent us some um, writing of Ashen and uh, Zora Neale Hurston to kind of give us some context of what she was doing. And I was so blown over by that. I was like, yes, I'll be in the show. And talking with Norman, first they had wanted something that we had made before. And it wasn't, it, it was it's a little damaged. So we talked about making a new work and in our conversations, we were looking for a particular point of inspiration. So I have to testify about Terry Adkins, who um, to our surprise is also in the show, a great artist that's um, on the other side of the Kalunga line now, um, who did a lot of work with music and sculpture and found objects. And Norman and I have worked a lot with found objects and bringing things together and he also was a, um, a student of Martin Perrier's, 
who we both as furniture make trains as furniture makers worship and sculptors and so I think that both of those artists were very masterful at bringing together um, objects and form and things that were used before in new ways. And I think that at many people of color, you know, we take things that exist and put them together in new ways. We, um, you know, miscegenate different cultures that we come in contact with and have created this culture of African-American art and testimony. And um, so I think in bringing together the piece that we did, COVID times, we worked in separate studios, but started from this point of inspiration around someone that we wanted to honor. So part of our, uh, the, the title of our work is Sweet Jelly Roll for Terry. And, um, uh, yesterday, Norman, Jasmine asked me, like, where did the title come from? And I was like, we're going to have to ask Norman, because all I knew is I just wanted for Terry in the name. And then Norman added his spin on it. So he'll have to, to testify about that. Okay, come on, Norman. Come ahead and testify for us, brother. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Bridge Projects, for inviting us. This is so great to have any opportunity I can to collaborate with Phil Wilson and, and really uh, work at some truly improving, um, particularly in COVID, we had to improv through co various conversations. Um, but it was a, a sweet journey to get to know you guys and, and to create this piece uh, for the space. Uh, sweet Jelly Roll. Um, so Bessie Smith was a, a, a name uh, that Terry Atkins uh, sort of uh, brought back to life. And I think part of his practice was really bringing to light uh, uh, people uh, and particular times that didn't get the light that it needed. Uh, and so Sweet Jelly Roll came out of, uh, I think me and Fo were in a contemplative state, thinking about what to name it, um, but we also work in this, uh, design can be really serious. And so playing in that field, we always try and keep it playful um, and, and, uh, and respectful at the same time. So Sweet Jelly Roll, and, and looking over the trajectory of, of Bessie Smith, Sweet Jelly Roll just felt really fitting to, to the way me and Fo kind of roll. Um, and so that's, and it stuck, because uh, I presented it to Fo with the idea that ah, maybe this, and, and Fo loved it, and, and it stuck, and I, you know, as, after reading into Sweet Jelly Roll, I think Bessie Smith might have had some other uh, ideas around what Sweet Jelly Roll uh, in, <laughs> in relationship to uh, the female genital, uh, but, but, you know, I, I think for, for us, it's really, in an effort to respect Terry and, and sort of his, some of his research, it was really rich to hold on to this name. And I think it fits, so thanks. Okay. Well, you know, it's really interesting because as Fo kind of started throwing in pieces, and what I mean by pieces, she talked about the Kalunga line, you know, this notion of these West Central Africans in the Bakongo region and the belief that when one dies, one crosses this spiritual river called Kalunga and then come into the, the, the other world, the ancestral realm. But the notion that they're continually being able to communicate between the ancestral realm and the temporal realm and the fact that Chicago and what you're doing at Black House is not only the center of gospel music, not that it was birthed there, but the Thomas Dorsey legacy, the fact of that church, which, and we talk about with Foe and her work around uh, archives and remembering and the fact that after the church burned down and the attempts to build it back up, but then also the center of the blues and Chicago blues and Chicago jazz. So I thank you for honoring that in this piece. And then also the notion of Jelly Roll Morton, right? So we've got all these pieces and I love the thing about these artists where they continually intersect and intertwine and confound all these different secular, 
sacred and secular spaces and, and themes. Now, Dario, I got to give you some, some my, my family's from Texas, all right, Dario, all right? So I know you're San Antonio and then a Houston implant, got my PhD at the University of Houston. You put down your work there, right? So Dario, and I studied African-American and Latin American history, so I love the intersection of the black and the brown and all those things that we're going to be working through and on. So tell me about your testimony to this uh, exhibit where you know, it, it, it was ostensibly about this African-American contemporary artist's position. And then here you step into the space telling us that you got something to say too. So give it up, my brother. All right, thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you for that great intro. Uh, you know what the show, has, it allowed me to revisit uh, a, a ancestral memory, I guess, in a sense that I, I don't often talk about or, uh, find a reason to really bring back up, but it is a crucial part of my trajectory as an artist. And my grandfather was a first uh, generation from, uh, from Nicaragua, moved to El Paso, uh, was a Baptist minister. He, he built a church from the ground up on his own, started his own congregation. <clears throat> I was never close to the side of my family, not very close, my father's side, but the few times I ever met my grandfather, the one that well, I has burned into my brain was I got to watch him uh, preach. And I will never forget this strange feeling of both alienness to, to this uh, side of my family and also a type of being uh, fire and brimstone, uh, everyone up uh, shouting and dancing and uh, feeling so disoriented in that environment from, from what was still part of my, my blood. And I'll never forget that I also, even though I'm uh, from Texas, I, don't, I, don't, I never quite learned uh, Spanish. The whole sermon was in Spanish. I didn't quite know what he was saying in literal sense, but it didn't matter. I, I got it. I got what was going on. And, and I realized that I was, this is part of my blood. And it always lingered with me the the passion that I feel uh, as an artist and that I hope that I display in everything I do, that I could root it in a way I had never done before when I finally saw him uh, preach. Mm. And I've kept that, something about that is in me to this day. I, I, I will say that I'm very much a science-minded person uh, and, and the secular side of me is very strong and I have strong feelings about the role of separating the two. But that, that, those, those memories have always lingered in me. And I, I think it's probably reflected in the piece in the show too. I, I, interestingly, one of the things that we see a lot of times here in LA is there's a, a, a two things going on in Los Angeles and many other places. One, gentrification that many places in America are witnessing um, in terms of black and brown spaces turning into white upper middle class spaces, right? But also this notion of the intersection of black and brown in many of these traditionally kind of 1940s to the 1970s black spaces. And so there's always a scene every Sunday at Crenshaw and Slauson where there is this, this Spanish speaking evangelist and he's standing there on the corner and he's got that mic and you guys know these kind of, it reminds me of those, those scenes out of some James Baldwin novel, right? Where there's this storefront preacher, but this corner preacher, right? And he's out there. And even though I know that many people who are passing don't understand the words because they don't speak Spanish, mm -hmm. it is the fervor that he brings. And I know when I ever see him there, he's out there, he's El Poder. You know what I mean? And he's, you know, the power of Cristo and el Dios, you know, and he's so pushing. And that where you, you, you know, I speak English and Spanish, but for people, I know they, they feel the conviction, right? They feel the spirit. And I can imagine for you as a young person watching <laughs> do that thing, and it sears it into you, correct? Yeah. Uh, uh, next person we're going to bring up, and he's in, in many ways a, a, a huge influence for this entire exhibit and some of the work that he has done um, and put down in terms of conceptualizing this concept of otherwise, right? Of otherwise. So we've got this sacred and this secular, but I think that we fit in this otherwise, right? This gray space that uh, sometimes pushes this and sometimes pushes that. Uh, I want to bring up Dr. Crawley. Dr. Crawley, uh, tell me first off, and I'm going to ask you two questions. First, talk to me about otherwise. What is, what is otherwise for you, how you have articulated this in the academic, artistic, and social spaces? Talk about otherwise first. Um, well, I feel like you said we had to do a testimony. Well, no, no, you can go testimony first. Go testimony first. Well, I'm, just we'll saying, 
Go testimony yeah. first, brother. Go testimony. Yeah, Before you bring the word, testimony. give me your testimony. <laughs> well, you, you know, you, you're not, you're supposed to set up your testimony by saying first, giving honor to God who's heaven. Yeah, yes. Pastor, saints, and friends. You know, you have to set it. So, you know, I'm, I'm not a believer anymore in a God figure, but I am at least wanting to give honor to the ones who have gathered us here today. And so really thankful for Bridge Projects for even um, conceptualizing the show otherwise revival um, to Kara and to Jasmine for their curatorial imagination and for the artists that I feel like, you know, it's, it is a, I don't even believe in blessings anymore. But y'all know what I mean. Yes, you do. Stop yeah. saying that, man. Stop saying that. Stop like a, saying that. Like there's, there's a kind of thing like a blessing, um, something alongside the concept of blessing, to be mm. able to be in conversation um, and like have work in proximity to these artists who are very who are doing very moving and inspiring work. And so I'm just really thankful to even be here and to be a part of the conversation. Um, I don't know. Otherwise, possible. I mean, yeah. Otherwise, for me, is not a place that you can reach. It's not about utopia. It's not like once you get to, um, I used to watch Jim and the Holograms a lot as a kid. I used to sneak and watch it because I felt that there was something wrong with a boy watching Jim and the Holograms and learning all the songs. Um, but I used to watch it a lot. And there was a song called Shangri-La that she sang with the holograms. I'm not looking for Shangri-La. I'm not looking for this thing in some other kind of world that you can never reach. Um, and once you reach it, you finally got otherwise. So for me, otherwise is not a place. It is a posture and a practice. It is a mode through which you live relation with other people um, and with the entire entire creaturely world. And so the earth and animals, like how are we dealing with plant life? How are we dealing with ecology? And so otherwise possibility and the word otherwise for me is really an attempt to think about how can we practice alternatives to what is called the normal and what is deemed normal through violence and the power of things like the state and institutions like the church. How can we practice alternatives to those normatives because those things are produced specifically through violent interactions with people and with the earth and with animals and with plant life? And are there other ways that we can actually be in relation with one another that is actually more tender, more caring, more just, more loving, more faithful to our creaturely existence that, um, that honors the fact that we are fragile um, beings and we are here for a very short amount of time. Um, and so for me, what otherwise does is it points us in the direction of the practice of alternatives without ever reaching a there. It's always about the posture. It's always about the direction. It's always about the gesture. It's never about grasping it and owning it and having it because that's settler colonialism. And I'm not interested in owning things as private property. And so otherwise for me is where are the practices of alternatives being um, sort of announcing themselves? Where are these practices emerging? And how can we cultivate a disposition for and a, and, a, and a sort of celebration of the practice of alternatives in their plurality. And so that's what for me otherwise is naming. Okay, so I, I, I gotta jump in on here for you because when you started talking about alternative spaces, brother, right? You started talking about alternative ways of being. I was listening to an interview with Fo at CCA and she was talking about this notion of radical making, right? And what that really means, radical making. And at the core of it was for her, this concept about freedom. And so go, go there a little bit, then we can go in some other directions, but go talk to us about your notion of radical making and freedom. I won't give all what you said there, but you, you know, go ahead and, and, and kind of work that sure. for us. Sure. Um, you know, I guess what this year has led me to is you know, a lot of blackness is defined by whiteness and white supremacy. And I'm like, I need to step out of that space. And what if I imagine blackness, not in opposition, not as an oppressive force. And if I operate out of blackness in a sense of freedom and not as a response to or different than, but just as it is, to me, that's freedom. You know, I get asked to go to talks and, you know, there's a lot of 
ways that Black people are defined in America. And now what I call the Great Awakening, whereas like a lot of white folks have woken up a little bit to our experience of oppression of Black, Brown, and Indigenous people. That's what I call the Great Awakening. This 2020 mm -hmm. was a Great Awakening. And so now they want to talk about racism, but it's like, I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about my Blackness. I want to talk about what is that space that music delivers us from through the inner spiritual ear to another um, fantastical space. You know, when I think of gospel music and I think of jazz, I think that those, when I think of jazz innovators, I feel like they went to another place and pulled it down to our corporal existence. They pulled it across that Columbia line again. They pulled it down and just mixed it up. Same thing with gospel is kind of reaching up. Yes. You know, like jazz, I feel like it's pulling down some of that wonderful stuff. And gospel is like opening this window where you, where the, I'll call it the God force or universal force or this beautiful universal experience or Buddha nature, how, whatever you want to call it, where there's this convening of our experience as humans with this exalted state and there's like this meeting that comes together to me that freedom is what kind of saved us during the 400 years or so and so i think of those things as very precious places to touch mm -hmm. where the music takes you to yes. you know and so when i think of my making as radical, I'm trying to put my making into that same space. And Dario, I know you're, you're, you've been working a lot on this notion of sound, the witness of sound, and this issue about commemorating and remembering and all the rest of these things about recorded sound. So let's talk about that a bit with regards to your work here, but also your work generally, and especially the direction it seems like you're going in terms of starting to experiment with singers and dancers and some other things in your work. So talk about that. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, yeah, well, uh, the, there's some, here's a thought I'd love to put in everybody's mind. I, I've always been fascinated with the discrepancy between what we can know through our sound history and what we can know through light history. So for example, you know, Hubble telescope, as of today, we can image starlight from over 13 billion years ago. But in our recorded history, we, we can't go much further back than the late 19th century, just because the technology wasn't around to record live, and I'm being specific to live recordings. And think about that. There's a 13 billion year gap between how we can know uh, sound and light. <clears throat> and that, to me, has always just broken my heart. Because when I think of a lot of my work is trying to challenge the assumption that we can't hear back any further through technological processes, but of course the creative spirit and how we think about it uh, poetically, philosophically, religiously, like we, we have really good tools in other disciplines on how to sort of try to close that gap. But, I, but I'm trying to take it very literal. Like, can I hear someone singing from the middle of the 19th century? Or why stop there? What about the 16th century? The problem is, as many probably figured out, we, how, well, how do you do that? Because this, the sound waves didn't embed themselves in a, in a permanent medium that we can play back. So without you know, going into more specifics, my work has really been about trying to challenge the assumption that we can't hear back further in a very literal way. And, and uh, just I'll leave a thought, but a film I just recently finished, I, I have this section where I, I propose to people, what if all we ever had of Billie Holiday were written transcripts of her performances? Just imagine the, the uh, what, what an insult that seems and how un, un, unsettling it seems that we would never know what she sounded like, but we could have a transcript. And the truth is, is that for the vast majority of people have ever sung on this planet, that's, that's the case. We maybe don't even have transcripts. So I feel art and art thinking 
maybe in the type of space Ashen's getting at, uh, as far as otherwise, allows for rethinking these problems of, of covering up uh, that gap. Yes, yes. In interestingly for me, that's so why I grew up Methodist. And so even this, 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 the way I'm dressed or whatever else probably says something about my AME uh, upbringing, you know, praise God from all who all blessings flow, you know, praise God, you know. And we always looked down on Pentecostals. Uh, um, I, I remember this. I remember the first time I ever went to a Pentecostal church. I grew up in a little um, community just 60 miles east of Los Angeles, but I literally grew up on a dirt road. And there was this, this church, and we just call it Pastor Williams Church. You know what I mean? That's what we, you know, Pastor Williams Church. And Pastor Williams was the first female pastor I'd ever met in my life. And the church still sits there today. And it's got one of them long names, you know what I mean? The Church of the Everlasting God of the True Tabernacle of Praise, you know, all the rest of this kind of stuff. And we used to say that it was in a chicken coop. I mean, that's what we, now this is kids, right? But I remember going there on Friends and Family Day. So they invited us and we went because Big Mama, who lived across the street from me, literally that was, her name was Thelma, but everybody called her Big Mama on our street, was like, y'all can come to church with me today. And I remember them Terry. I remember them washing feet. I'm like, what the people taking off their shoes, right? What they, what they doing up in here taking off their shoes, right? And, and the notion of them laying hands on people and putting oils, and then the issue of speaking in tongues, right? And it freaked me out. I'm just being real. And I remember we developed in our little community a whole bunch of caricatures of the people we saw there. You know, we used to walk around as 11, 12 year olds going, -na 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 -na, you know what I mean? And you know, on the, on the football field, you know what I mean? You two score a touchdown and we, -na 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 -na, you know what I mean? Just insulting it. But for me, the, the, the journey into this Pentecostal space was led by a woman named Arizona Drains. And I'm picking up from your point, Dario, with regards to she was a Texas musician, biracial, Latino, and African-American, blind, and she's the first woman ever recorded playing gospel. And she traveled from Texas to Chicago to record, and she records 29 sound sides for OK Records. And for me, the first like archival piece that I ever was able to get was the contracts and the, the correspondence between her and the label, where she's just trying to get money from them because they're not trying to pay. And she's saying, basically, I hear my stuff being played on the radio. There's a, I should be getting paid too, right? And for me to have to finally find her recorded on these little CDs from a company called Document Records. And for those of you guys who, who deal in early Pentecostalism, it's based in Blodnock, Scotland, and they have dedicated themselves to the preservation of these recordings. And to hear her sing, I'm a witness for my Lord. I'm a witness for my Lord. My soul is a witness for my Lord. And those early 1920s recordings where in three minutes they were trying to capture a full church service, right? I mean, a preacher, the, the, the background, the hums and ha's, and so that notion that you're bringing up about sound and if we could hear, right? So all the rest, I'm reading these things about who she is and whatever else, but nothing compared to hearing this sound. And I didn't get it in a full church, right? I didn't get it in these things. So I get where you're coming from with that. I, I, I'm so with that. Norman, you, you, you're you a designer, you make things, right? And once again, congratulations on the new position at UIC being full, right? You know, so congratulations on all those things. Um, but, but talk to me about how that physical, how that transitions into the physical creation for you, how the, the spirit or how gospel or jazz, but musicality transitions into your creative process. So I'm, I'm going to softly say, you know, Jazz is, is, for me, it's a background thing. It's, it's constantly uh, playing in my studio or, or in my home. Uh, gospel, on the other hand, is a, you know, it's, it's, it's a little more than Sundays, but it's been a part of my life since childhood. So I grew up on the south side of Chicago in Bronzeville. Uh, grandmother was a, a, a Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, which, which meant I was in church on Saturdays and then my mom was in church on Sundays. Um, and so I've, I've been sort of born and bred on uh, the gospel music, the word of, the word of God, um, um, and all of that uh, makes it into the studio with me. Mm -hmm. So I, I can work a late night and I will be, you know, sort of shielded by and never feeling alone by you know, feeling the spirit, 
Um, I also had other spiritual experiences growing up that really influenced me as a person and my work today. And, you know, it's strange to say, but it's, it's another way of expressing yourself. But dancing at the music box when I was 16, 17 years old at mm -hmm. three o'clock in the morning and listening to, you know, this is some of the first times I heard Bessie Smith was when Ron Hardy was playing it at the music box. Mm -hmm. You know, my name is Bessie Smith. And mm -hmm. when I sang, you listen. And and that with a with a strong beat behind it, you know, I'm 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 feeling the same energy that I feel yeah. when I'm at church and, and the Holy Ghost. So so I'm I'm feeling new move new movements in, in, in different ways. Uh, but they're all coming to me. They're coming from the same place. Uh, and so a lot of my work is, is, as a designer is sort of driven by intuitive sketches that are then turned into computer models that are then, you know, possibly cut by hand or cut by CNC. All of it, which is, it still has this very intuitive sort of playful moment with me. Mm -hmm. I love the craft uh, that, that we get to insinuate throughout our work um, and so I you know it's it's always been a part of me I've never separated these things and so the work that comes out of my studio is sometimes very you know a, a hard thing that's left but a, a lot of it has a lot of intuition and I think the most playful parts are when we get to do these found object moments um, and now we're we're pushing more power into these found objects that were discarded in some way or another. Um, so, yeah. I, I hope that Give answers. me a specific song that works for you. Like when you're listening, like for me right now, you know, uh, Leandria Johnson has been working in my spirit. And you know that song, Lord, deliver me, you know, deliver me. And she, you know, she's a contemporary person, but draws so deeply on all of those traditions. And you hear everybody in her voice. Who's working for you, or who 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 has worked for you? Ah, uh, um, oh, I can't I can't think of the the artist, um, but the song is excellent. Is I name that one? Yes. <laughs> yes. You know who the artist is? Oh, I, I forget who it is, but it's a choir. But it's, it's I grew up in a church, and mm -hmm. my cousin sang it at church all the time. But excellent has always uh, been this familiar thing to me that every time I hear it, it's, it's an emotional moment for me. So I would have to stick with that. Yeah, listen, there's a version of that I by, I could call um, it, yeah. by uh, it, it's recorded at Jeremiah Smith's church there in Chicago. Um, there's yeah. a recording of it that to me is so powerful. It goes for like 10 minutes and it just works. And they are just, you hear the screeches, you hear the, you know, all that stuff being poured into that. But, but if you go on YouTube and just, uh, excellent, there's one from Jeremiah Rice Church there in Chicago. That yeah, just, Trinity is my church yes. here in Chicago. Okay, so. all right, all right, all right. We seeing it right there, okay. Ashan, <laughs> talk to me about this issue for you. So you, 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 you know, your intro is, you know, I'm not a believer anymore. Your intro is, I'm not talking about blessings anymore. Your intro is, but man, when I'm studying you and I'm looking at all these things, mm -hmm. all I see is church. Yeah. Talk to me about what that means for you in terms of a, in a James Baldwin-esque moment, right? To have to leave the church to find spirit. Yeah. Talk to me about that. Well, you know, I, I, my friend um, and sister Jade Perry um, describes herself as a churchy uh, as a churchy mystic. And I think of myself as churchy. Um, a lot of the work that I'm trying to do both in my writing and in my um, art practice is to really say that churchiness is blackness, but churchiness is not, doesn't have to be reducible to Christianity at all. Mm -hmm. um, in my first book, I try to talk about the relationship between Islam and the black Pentecostal church, which a lot of people are and I think continue to be surprised by, but I think there's some deep resonances that I'm still trying to explore in work currently too. Um, and so for me, I, I want people to feel the churchy part, certainly, mm -hmm. but I don't want the work to be like, oh, in order to feel this thing that Sean Crowley is talking about, you have to convert to 
uh, uh, becoming a, a Pentecostal and going to a Pentecostal church in order to feel the thing that a Sean Crowley is talking about. So there are two things that I'm trying to do when I do my sort of work in general. On the one hand, I have absolutely no shame about <laughs> Black Pentecostalism, the thing that I was supposed to be ashamed of. And you talked about how, you know, as kids, people would talk about the Pentecostals, right? Mm -hmm. um, when I was growing up, I heard all the things that people would say about us as Pentecostals. And like, we didn't care. <laughs> like, and for me, that is a deeply Black practice where the thing that you say about us that we're supposed to be ashamed about, like, it's just like, oh, well, that's just what you think. But you don't understand the joy that we actually feel and so we're going to cultivate this joy practice, regardless of what you say about us. And if you want to, you can join us. But, you know, we're not, go we're not going to stop doing the thing that we're doing just because you have narrated this in a certain kind of way that makes you comfortable. Um, and so for me, the work that I'm trying to do is, on the one hand, honor this space that taught me how to love parts of myself that, I was so that people say that I should be ashamed about. But also I'm trying to critique that world. And so like the Pentecostal church world from that birthed me, that gave me an appreciation for music and the Hammond organ and for loving my flesh is also a place that taught me that I should be deeply ashamed about the fact that I practice queerness. And I'm not ashamed about the fact that I practice queerness. And one of the reasons I'm not ashamed is because Black Pentecostals taught me how to not be ashamed of the thing mm -hmm. that I do mm -hmm. and the thing that I practice in relation with other people. And so I, for me, there is no contradiction between churchiness and, and being agnostic at all um, I, because that's not a contradictory. So I think that there are a whole bunch of people that go to churches every Sunday who are just as agnostic as I am, mm -hmm. but because they enjoy community in certain kinds of ways, they continue to go. I think there's several people that go to church who are atheists and just don't talk about it. Like there are various modalities through which belief happens in the institutional church. And me saying, I don't go to church no more, I'm agnostic, isn't the only example. There are so many examples of folks that are there still too, who are also having these sort of complex, deeply, um, deeply conflictual relationships to these institutions. And I, I kind of learned about agnosticism through a certain kind of practice of one of my aunts in the church that I grew up in. And so like for me, it, it, I have had examples of what it means to try to honor this complexity. Um, and so I don't, I don't think of my churchiness and the thing that I want you to feel as antithetical to a deep critique of one theology and doctrine that is deeply harmful, misogynoiristic and transphobic and homophobic. Like, I don't find those to be contradictory at all. Um, but also, I don't want to ever think that the only people that practice the feeling that I'm talking about are Pentecostals, because that's also not true. It can be felt in Islam, it can be felt in Buddhism, it can be felt with atheist gatherings as well. It can be felt in bridge projects or in California African American Museum when you are looking at a piece of art. That it can be felt and can be experienced and can be practiced wherever you are, it seems to me. And so that's the thing that I am most trying to explore. And, and I'm trying to explore it through the thing that I know, which is Pentecostalism, without ever wanting it to be um, uh, without ever wanting to be parochial and say, it's only happening here. This is the only place you can feel it. I mean, we're here to talk about jazz. And I think that jazz is, people often sort of make it antithetical to like gospel music or the, 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 the opposite of gospel music. Or like people used to say when I was growing up, oh, the blues is just gospel with different lyrics. I'm like, it's not that either. Like mm -hmm. these are different modalities through which spirit is actually being practiced and felt and negotiated and argued over. And so just trying, I'm, I'm, I'm asking questions through Pentecostalism, but I'm not trying to say that Pentecostalism is the answer to those questions. Okay. Fo, I see you, I, I'm taking your body language. And, and, and as Aishan is talking, and I see you with some amen moments and some, and some, some bodily affirmations that say and preach, brother. Um, talk to me about jazz, about your creation, about music. Talk to me about, you know, what was resonating with you as, as, as Aishan was, was speaking? Well, I was thinking about what everybody has said, Dario and Ashen and Norman, and I was thinking about sound. And 
Dara and I share a, um, a exploration with the idea of cabinets of curiosities. And I was thinking there, you know, I, I built a cabinet of curiosity as a slave cabin with a fictional character. And in that cabin is an archive that I played with uh, from um, um, slave narratives. And I, when I was working on it, I remember I was listening to a lot of the interviewers and the responses from these former enslaved people. And many times the interviewer would be a white person and they asked a question, well, 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 what was it like with your master in the field and blah, blah. And the first response was like, well, and you know, they said, well, what about blah, blah, blah. And they'd say, well, and I feel like in the well is the answer. Like the whole answer is in the well, but they're negotiating how to tell you because am I safe telling the truth to this person who's white? What are they gonna think of what my experience is? Um, how do I communicate what it's like? They're asking me like, how is it to drink you know, water today when that was my life and it was you know, significant and, and challenging and unsafe at times. And so I, I think of sound like I was thinking about some of the stuff Daria was saying also, how sound carries many more dimensions than we think. So it's like, I've been, you know, I played with just putting together these series of, well, 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 kind of like the way Ashen had played with yes and yes, Lord. It's the same thing that, you know, it's like, if you could translate that well, wow, <laughs> that's the story, that's the narrative right there, right? So that's what I was thinking of as he was talking. Yes. Don't can, know. I, can I Go say ahead. something? Can yeah, I, jump I, in, jump in. Go ahead. I just, so like the, the beautiful thing about the well is for me, it's untranslatability. Like you can say it and you can sort of reproduce it, but I think that there's something that remains in it that cannot actually be translated into something else. And that's the gift of it, right? And, and for me, that, there's something about like black social practice of music making and dance and, and visual art. And that is, a both, it's both like about what we give as like, you know, the visual piece that you will see or the furniture or the sound piece that you will hear, but there's something that is retained in it that cannot be given over. And I think that that's, that it's like the, the protection of mm -hmm. and the cultivation of a certain kind of disposition that is necessary to allow us to survive, thrive, and produce different kinds of relations to the normative world. That's really, really important. So like, I, I love the, I love the well that you're talking about. And I love that for me, it sounds like it, there's something that is retained in it that, you know, can't be translated. And that, that refusal of translation that's in the actual enunciation of it is like this beautiful gift of like black culture. Yeah. Yeah. In interestingly, when you just said that about the well, and I'm thinking of it in two different ways, you know, like the well, but also the notion of a well, right? And you like, you see just the beginnings of it and you don't know how deep it goes, right? You don't know how deep it goes and the waters that flow into that well. You, you have no understanding of the depth in which it goes. All we see is the outside where we can dip this bucket down in there and try to bring up some water that's gonna be refreshed, but we don't know what's feeding that well, right? right? Um, I also think Dario, jump in here. As they're talking and they're this notion about jazz and, and, and blues, I'm thinking about this notion of Thelonious Monk. And you guys know when, uh, it's an anecdote that's been told numerous times that, you know, there would be the, the, the printed uh, uh, notes on the sheet, right? And here's the, here's the song. And somebody else is watching it and they can, you know, they're, 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 they're good. They can follow the notes. But then when they would hear Monk play it, they'd say, but it's different, right? And they look at the notes and they're on the page and they try to play it, but it's different. And he described it as the blue note, right? About that, 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 
that note of, of, of pain, of journey, of spirituality, of all these other things that the Western musical tradition or canon can't necessarily capture in the notation, right? So Dario, go in and, and, and let's, let's keep rolling with that. Okay, well, maybe I could connect, building off that, maybe I could connect uh, what Fo and Ashan just said and try to, here, here, I'll pose it as a question to what was, uh, Ashan just proposed. Uh, about that untranslatable part, uh, which, as Bo is saying, is really only revealed through other sensory modes. It can't just be on the page. We need to activate all these other modes to sort of understand, oh, we're missing something. You know, reading the lyrics, you know, all of me, why not take all of me? Is, you know, there's a beauty to that on the page, but wow, it's transformed when you hear it. But, mm -hmm. but Ashan, what I, what I want to ask, though, is, if there is a, an unbridgeable gap, in a sense, that you're proposing with uh, this untranslatable aspect, what do you think, though, that that means for the other side, the audience, or the person who's putting the effort into trying to translate it, who, because of their own motivations, like everything from arch archiving for posterity, so uh, you know, we can have these kinds of conversations, but also the motivation of us reaching out to each other across barriers, the motivation of that person reaching across, if they already know it's at some level unobtainable, does that affect the motivation at all? And I say that, you know, with, with real interest because I, I feel that as an artist, I've put a lot of eggs in my basket as far as reaching out and not always knowing it will work, but that there's something in the trying that's worth it. And that we owe it to each other to try, even if we get it wrong at some level. Anyway, I'll, I'll throw that out there. I oh, love that. Go ahead, Sean. I mean, I, just, I would just say that it, it produces in me a kind of um, necessary humility and, and recognition that I, can't act, that I can't capture fully. And that's like, for me, that's beautiful. Um, <laughs> it doesn't mean that you don't attempt to uh, be in relation. It just means that what our particles in our bodies are doing is like constantly orbiting but never touching one another. And yet somehow you've created a body. Like you literally have flesh based on the fact that you don't have things that are touching. And so like there's something about the space between that remains that becomes the occasion for you actually having a body. And so I like to think about like uh, when I'm trying to like engage in, a, let's say a translational pro or when I'm trying to teach my students, let's talk about, like, I know that everything that I'm saying ain't, ain't actually hidden. And that's okay because it's not about like, on this day, I'm going to convince you that police should be abolished, right? It's about the relation that is created between you and I, which is predicated upon the space that happens. And so what's necessary is this constant going back and attempting to do it again and and this repetition and for me, so when I recognize that there is something that is retained um, in the translation or that is refuse, refusing to be translated even in the process of translation, that just produces in me a certain kind of humility that means that I have to attempt to practice honor and that I have to attempt to practice care, but I can never presume to know in fullness and I can never presume to have exhausted the possibility of thinking with or, uh, or attempting or the things that you're talking about, trying, being in relation, um, a, a, attempting to make things that resonate with others. But that all is true and I can do those things precisely because I recognize that I will never actually do a thing that, is, that is, has fully exhausted the possibility. Mm -hmm. Norman, Norman, I, I, this, this reminds me of, I was watching a piece with you, and it's self-portrait, okay? Self-portrait, a piece of yours, right? And uh, an individual is trying to, you're trying to explain to somebody the inspiration behind these 20 foes, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> right? <laughs> and, 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 and you didn't want to use a certain language to explain why you looked up or the, who are these people on the south side of Chicago that you looked up to, you get me? And yeah. because of the danger of the language, right? 
that someone can then, right? And so, so I'm, I'm, I'm stopping my sentences because I understand there's that issue of the intranslatable. And talk about that a little bit, about that process where you're trying to create. You want to, of course, be, be accepted into galleries and all the rest of these things, right? And, and, and the ecosystem of what we do in the world of art. But at the same time, you hold true to this notion that there's some things that can't be told, right? Yeah, or, yeah, I think, I think, thank you. That's a real good question because I struggle with it every time I present that particular piece and quite a few others, but I think it hit me when you know, in grad school at the School of the Art Institute where I was given, you know, uh, uh, studio and, and, and uh, access to any machine I needed to, to mm -hmm. utilize or, uh, and, and time, I think is what it was more than anything, uh, to tell a story that I know most of the world won't understand because they're not from where we're from. Black folks gonna get it right away, right off the top, like fancy cars, big wheels, you know, gangster rims, that's an easy one for us. But to translate that into a, a piece of work that, that encompasses, you know, colonialism, uh, uh, you know, past, present, and future of, of me, it was a very selfish moment, but at the same time, I felt like that it's exactly what was needed. And so trying to, I think I got sick of translating, uh, mm -hmm. mainly. It's it's really like if if I don't tell my story now, no no one will get to tell my story, and so the translation will come later. Some study it, pick it up. You, I think a lot of my struggle through that time was these white. I hate to bash. I'm not gonna bash, but it's the truth. Um, my advisors don't understand the stories that I'm trying to say, so I spend more time trying to explain it than just doing it. And so self-portrait was a moment where I just got to unleash and let go and be free uh, and tell the story that I needed to tell. And I think that that's what a lot of us need to do in these moments of practice. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about that same process, about this, this unknown, this blue note, this space for you where, you know, when are you really free? Are you free because you truly express yourself or are you free because you, you had a solo show at Met, right? If I had a solo show at the Met, it's because I'm free, you know? And I want to say, like, I love that piece of Norman's because it also has the potential to move and roll, you know? And, um, you know, in thinking about the untranslatable, um, you know, that's so true what Ashton was talking about in that I feel like it's not these things, some of these things are not translatable in the mind or the intellect, but I feel like the body understands them. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The body understands yeah. them and the body just doesn't have a corporal language to tell our brains what it means, but our body knows exactly what these things are. And I think when I think of my art, in the same way that Norman was talking about, you know, having to explain, it's like many times, you know, I'm doing artist talks or I'm in a gallery and I'm, you know, there are people and they want me to explain the work. And, and I kind of refuse because I'm like, the work should speak for itself. And whatever you get from the work, there's no right or wrong. It is the work, what, how you experience the work is just as legitimate as someone else that experiences the work who may experience it differently. And I don't wanna take that from you by telling you my, you know, I can tell you my inspirations, I can tell you how it came about, but I feel like once the work is done and it's there, just appreciate it, please. <laughs> just appreciate it or whatever you get is valid. I think that people are trained, museums have trained people to think that they have to have a PhD to understand a piece of art or to collect a piece of art. And whatever your relationship is to that object is what it is and it's valid and it's cool. So many times people ask me, well, what's your art about? I'm like, you're looking at it. Tell me what you think is it about? And then we get in a conversation. And usually like when we end up talking, I'm like, there's nothing you said that's wrong. You know, there's nothing that you've said is wrong. So I think that there are other dimensions of knowing 
and we just don't in the western world we just don't understand them i think our ancestors understood other worlds of knowing and had other worlds mechanisms languages that aren't you know like spoken words you know they had the language of possession they had the language of dance they activated symbols and allowed the spirit to come in them you know i remember coming home a lot of times and my mother had gospel music on and as a little girl she would get happy and i was like is God taking my mom away? Is she gonna come back? You know, <laughs> you know. I didn't understand what the experience was, but you know, when you go to church and you know, and having the space to do that and not, you know, I, you know, it's 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 really great listening to Ashen because he's given a language to some of those things, even when he doesn't have the language for the thing. He, he, I think you're, you're helping us put it in a context to understand it. So I like, I love reading your work, but I think of my art in the same way as the, well, it's like, it's there, like just, just access it if you can, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Interestingly, cause Ashen, and, and make sure, I, I want to make sure that I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Ashen or Ashan? Ashan. Oh, Sean. Okay, you, you know us, right? Right. Our parents are very creative and innovative from the get down, right? And and, and many times we 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 got it. And I, and I say this in a, in a in a good way, right? We all are in education, and we all have those days when we have the roll sheet, right? And we're going through the roles, yes. trying to begin this process of introducing ourselves to these students. And there is something that is unpronounceable to us, right? Yeah. But for that student and for their parent. You need to understand me because this is the way I'm spelling it. This is the way it is pronounced. And damn everybody else if you don't get it, right? Right? It, it, damn it, everybody else if that doesn't quote unquote phonetically fit, right? If, if the accent is in the wrong place or the enya is not there, whatever that thing is, right? So, Asan, talk to me about this process for you, about being now looked at for many people, not just in this country, but around the world as this person trying to, no, come on, brother, let's, let's, let's be real here, man, come on. Let's, let's give dap and props where props are due. Um, as this person kind of leading this charge in this multidisciplinary space, and I have to say to you as a person who has struggled in the academy with trying to be able to walk in my truth, right? I mean, to be all that I am. I mean, I literally left the academy for years because I just, I just felt like I wasn't, like my spirit was dying. You know what I mean? Like I, I felt that the, the notion of publishing these papers and you know answering questions that to me seemed <laughs> so dang obvious. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know. And then you watching you from a performance artist to a visual artist to a writer to a commentator to all these things. And I'm looking at you, and I know you're younger than me, but I'm saying to myself, keep moving, bro. You know, because you're 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 walking in a truth that's opening doors and battering down things for everybody else. So talk to me about what that means for you in this space and how you are carrying it forward as one of the leaders in trying to get us to think different otherwise. Well, um, thank you for that. Bro, it's, it's true, man, it's true. No, I, 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 appreciate, I appreciate the question. You know, I, um, I'm gonna make this quick. I, no, I go ahead, my, do what you gotta do. You know, I had in my Instagram uh, bio for a long time, wannabe artist and um, I had a couple of I have a couple of pieces at the California African American Museum, yes. um, and two here at uh, Bridge Projects. And a friend of mine from elementary school sent me a private message that can you please take the wannabe part out of your bio? And I said, what are you talking about? I didn't even realize it was still there. Um, and so for me, it's like it's it's very it's it's just it's humbling more than anything else. Um, but. I, you know, I'm not inventing nothing. I feel like I'm in the tradition of black studies, which is like, you know, the folks that I look at are like, yeah, sometimes I can't answer it in anthropology. Sometimes I have to sing it, Zora Neale Hurston. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I can't answer it through sociology. Sometimes I have to draw a, a, this beautiful image or make a novel, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, that sometimes I can't answer it through a sort of academic critical text. Sometimes I have to make some poetry. Audre Lorde, um, Fred Moten, my friend and mentor. 
Um, sometimes I, I can't answer it through Kantian philosophy. Sometimes I have to answer it through creating this small room with newspaper print over it and writing over it, Adrian Piper. Like, I feel like there have been folks who have modeled for me the attempt to say that the categorization of academic knowledge is not really the way Black folks move. And like, we, we can try to practice our tradition um, of thought and yes. sometimes it'll emerge in places like academia, but sometimes it'll emerge in places like an art museum. Sometimes it'll emerge in places like, um, like an NPR essay. So like, and so it's very humbling to, to have been given the space to explore these ideas. If I didn't have friends that said that my visual pieces looked, if they didn't, if they said it looked silly or if they never responded to it at all, I would have stopped. And so the, I think the most necessary thing is having a community of people who love you and care for you and tend to you and that really, really help you to cultivate your practice of imagination because without them, and this is not hyperbole at all, without them, I wouldn't be doing, I would have stopped after the first piece. Like, oh, they think it looks silly, so I'm not going to do this. But because they literally encouraged me to keep trying to do things, um, I kept trying to do things. And, you know, I started posting these Yes Lord clips on Instagram in 2019. And like, you know, they sound very different than the final version of it. But like no one, none of my friends said, this sounds ridiculous, please stop. Um, or, and none of them said, you shouldn't keep trying to do this. They all tried to encourage me to figure out what I was trying to think about. And so it's always been for me, the community of folks that care for me, that help make possible the writing or the teaching or the art practice. And without literally, like this, I'm not joking. Without them, we wouldn't be having this conversation. And so I'm really thankful for them because I bring them into the room with me because they are the, they are the reasons why I, I mean, I'm scared to present every single thing that I do and every single piece of writing that I, I like, do I know how to write? But like, or do I know how to pay? But like, I don't, I don't fear because, or I can work through the fear because of my friends. And so I'm thankful for them. Mm. Sorry, talk to me about caregiving. Talk to me about your family. Talk to me about what that does for you as you function in an art space that's very different than maybe, you know, what your family background may have been and how that community um, influences your art. Well, um, I, I love to proudly brag about my mother and say that she was, she was a longtime hospice nurse, uh, continues to work with dementia patients. And I say this with all, all sincerity, my, the greatest role model I've ever had as an artist is watching a hospice nurse. Uh, and how weird and wrong that sounds in the, in the contemporary art world to say, is itself, I think, reflective of something. But watching the, the attention to emotions, heightened emotions at the end of life, that even in the final moments, they, these, everyone is worthy of dignity and some sense of closure, if possible. Uh, just can't thank my mother enough, even though it was really hard to have a little boy watching some of that. Um, can't thank her enough for giving me that. As I've matured as an artist, it has never once left my mind that, that, that the standards of a hospice nurse shouldn't somehow factor into how I think about art. And, you know, that gets in, I think, to a beautiful thing that all, all the artists here, I don't want to speak for them, but may, may, I think I'm hearing too, is we have maybe more room and maybe just completely grab a hold of the notion, the connection between art and healing uh, and its possibilities of doing that. Uh, and I've put a lot of my life into exploring that in very you know, practical ways, like working with physicians. Like I want to know, is there some skill set I've developed as an artist that can, on the term of a physician, increase the health of another? while at the same time fully maintaining all the metaphorical 
poetic beauty I want to explore on that topic as well. So I, I like to think that I have a spectrum of approaches at this point. And I continue to work in the medical community quite a bit, um, trying to learn, especially with heart transplant surgeons. I've done a lot of work with them and, and the unique knowledge they carry. Uh, you know, the handful of people on this planet who've ever literally held a heart in their hands is it should offer some insight into humanity uh, that I would like to, to know and that I'm not going to have as an artist directly, but I feel that I should collaborate in such a way to find out. So uh, I, I'm guessing others have similar feelings about that possibility between, in arts role and, and healing. Yeah. Wait, but, no, no, don't, 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 don't give it up yet, brother. <laughs> I want to stay here a little bit. So what has that then presented for you when we talked about, you know, being in the art world and then talking about that this notion of this caregivers, you know, it's not all these art shows, it's this. Talk to me about, I'm, and, I'm, and I have a lot of my students who are on the Zoom right now, and this notion of how I get them to believe that they as people of color can walk into these art spaces knowing that they have a knowledge, right? But so fearful of how that knowledge is being judged and wondering if they can ever truly express themselves. And so mm. when you're talking, you're talking to me, but you're talking to numerous of my students that are on this, and I guarantee you people who are tuning in. Talk to me about that, that interesting way of affirming yourself and your journey in this world? Well, I'm a huge advocate of being broadly curious. And as much as I love science and academia, you know, we, we've entered an age of specialization for good reason. I'm not arguing we shouldn't. As I've talked to some of these heart surgeons, um, you know, who have maybe sometimes had less patience with me poking around in a poetic way with what they're doing, you know, I'll never forget one of them told me once, you know, uh, do you want to live or do you want to die, Dario? If you want to live, then I don't need, I don't want to mess around with poetry. I want to know how to properly extract this organ. And, and that was revelatory to me because, although I heard that and I absolutely agree that that's true, but, but as brilliant as this uh, surgeon was and is, he had cut out a part of his life that he felt was unnecessary to making him a better surgeon. In, and, and at the heart of all things, that he had necessarily needed to de-romanticize the heart for him to understand it as a complicated pump. And that, you know, I, I illustrate that story because part of my life as an artist, and, and I'm also sensing from everyone here, is to challenge this assumption that a heart surgeon shouldn't be well-versed in poetic notions of the heart and to challenge a young artist why they shouldn't know the deep physiology of our circulatory system. Uh, there's an assumption that we shouldn't know, that we shouldn't sort of step over each other's disciplinary divides. And I, in my own experience, every time I poked at it, it was built pretty flimsy. It falls apart pretty quick, mm -hmm. uh, especially with the types of problems we are confronted with today. Uh, I don't see how one knowledge source could ever hold the answer to the types of problems we have, from, from racial divides to, uh, you know, synthetic biology, you know, the, the, the future of, of designer babies, which, you know, this is going to be a big societal point that we'll have to contend with. The range of problems are such that uh, I think the argument is necessary that we shouldn't be sitting on the sidelines or neutral as young artists to make this convincing case why the arts and humanities have a, uh, an important function in broader societal issues and vi vice versa. I'm the first to critique my side as an arts and humanities person. We can also build our own silos and uh, be really stubborn for input. So I mean, I'm, ab I'm talking a bit abstractly. I hope the heart surgeon oh, example was- uh, we live in, right? Yeah, but uh, yeah, I'm a really big advocate that we, we should poke at these assumptions. Yeah. Um, for me, it's bringing back some church stuff, y'all, okay? The whole issue of the letter and the spirit, right? And, 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 and for those of us who grew up and, you know, once I, once I started off Methodist, and then when I got older, I started going to this little Pentecostal church, 5529 South Vermont Street in Los Angeles, right down the street from Slauson in Vermont, where I see this, this dude giving it up every Sunday, right? And this was one of these traditional, this is go tell it out on the mountain kind of 
Pentecostal church spaces. Probably holds, you know, it used to be a laundromat, you know, and then converted into this church space. And in that space, there has been this opportunity for creative experimentation. Um, my son and daughter are both artists. My son, primarily a musician, but also working in multiple mediums. And to watch him get free, you know, because of the experimentation that is allowed in that Pentecostal church. There's been days where I've been in there hearing people and, and organically the music starts. And you know what I'm talking about, Ishan. It Organically it starts. And then you're hearing, man, is that confunction in there? You know what I mean? And then, and then you're hearing because these musicians are playing on Friday nights and Saturday nights and these other places, but bringing this here. And then there's somebody else who's that old school, hardcore holiness or hell person. You get where I'm coming from. And they, I don't have nothing to do with that. The Lord is not into that. I can't do that. But then you watch them get down. It was this song called, um, um, uh, let him, let me ride. And it's this whole thing about, you know, uh, you're like hitchhiking for the Lord. Right. And it's this, this church is from the fire baptized, uh, church. And, they all from South Carolina, from Spartanburg and all these other places, but in this LA space. And they have helped me as a former Methodist, traditionally trained historian, all that stuff to get back in touch with the spirit, right? right? And so Norman, talk to me about that for you and getting back in touch with it. And, and, and you know, we, we're about to close in, but I wanna, come on, let, 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 give me some more of that. Uh. So you're saying, how do I how do I keep close to it? Yeah, but also, how do you just what, what's that wellspring, and how do you tap into it, and how do you stay true to it, and how do you, I know we've talked a bit about this, but you know, how do you stay true to it? How do you keep it moving forward? How do you intersect those lines and not worry about the fact that you're intersecting those lines? How do you keep from you know? Talk to me about your process. I've I've, I've, ch I've checked out a lot of your stuff, man, and I, I'm really intrigued by the way that you move. I think it's I think it's care, you know, like I said, I grew up on the south side of Chicago I, and I never left. I've been here all my life. And that's part of it. Um, and I think, you know, a few people reached out to me as a young person and and the favors were there. It was a struggle, but the favors were there. Um, and I think the way I, I hate to sound cliche, but I, I try to give it up to everyone I can. Uh, if I got it, you know, and you need it, it's yours. Um, and then I, you know, I, I try to make it look easy. I try to, I try to make it look fun. I try to really like, I work hard at times, but I, I try and be optic, at least to people that would, would care. Uh, and I try to make it look easy and fun. Um, so, and I think that that will trickle down. Like I, I don't, I, there's no mystery to me. You can call me, any of y'all could call me. And nine times out of 10, I'm gonna call and talk to you. Um, and so, um, so I think it's, it's not putting up the shields, um, but always like, and I've learned a, so much from Fo Wilson. Hmm. And um, it's, it's that kind of love, but it's also that kind of like being straight up with people like, if it ain't that good, tell them it ain't that good. You know, if, if, I mean, I critique kids all the time and I have to find ways to say that it ain't that good in a very polite way, particularly during COVID. But it's, it's being as straight up as possible about your work, about the work you want to do and not being shameful. Um, and collaborations, I think, is like everything. Like it really asks you to come outside of yourself and, and deal uh, democratically with 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 another human being, um, and so that I mean I think it ain't no secret though. It's like real human things. I have not cursed at all. It's it's real human though, and and that's that's I like to yeah. I, I try to. Because you're an artist and you're serious about your shit, right? <laughs> <laughs> all right. I try, to, I try, but thank you guys. Yeah, that's that's it. Yes, um, yeah. And then yeah. phone, like I say, we're about to close it up here. But, you know, once again, I think it's not just about this exhibit about jazz and about gospel and about Pentecostalism and about art, but it's about what this art is doing and has the potential to do. So, you know, leave us with a message that, you know, from your heart um, to the folk out here and in, in what you do and in, in moving forward. 
title. Well, I'm going to go back to freedom and I'm going to thank Ashan for bringing queerness in the room. And I think even if I was totally heterosexual, I'd still identify as queer because I feel like, I don't know if you know the artist Nayland Blake, but he talks about queerness outside of the idea of sexuality and body and that it's a kind of space that's like otherwise in a way because it's on the margins you know it's it's not the normative space and i feel like that a lot of what i do in my work is just not along the lines of what's necessarily uh, accepted all the time so I just feel like I have the freedom to do my own thing and I do it. And um, it's maybe strange or other, but I accept it as me. You know, it took a while to get there mm -hmm. to accept all my weirdness and strangeness as me. But I feel like I create in a very queer space that's not normative. And it's not queer because of a sexual orientation. It's queer because it's queer. You know, it's it's not normative, it's not the usual, it doesn't fit in all of the places that normally one might want to or try to fit in. And I kind of, at this point, I mean, you know, <laughs> once you get a certain age, it's like later. I, I don't care what you think, I'm doing it. You, you can enjoy it if you want. If you don't want to, you don't have to. I ain't mad at you, but this is my thing and I appreciate it and I just, hope that all artists feel that way that they can revel in the otherwise mm -hmm. right sean that the otherwise actually is kind of the thing the place to be so i'll just end on that and say thank you to all of you and thank you to daniel for um leading this conversation it's been wonderful thank you so much yes sorry once again we're gonna um, you know, last kind of parting words. And once again, I'm, I'm gonna be totally selfish. I got young people on here watching. And in addition to this art and this exhibit, and gospel and jazz and all that stuff, um, you know, give us your, your, your parting shots. Uh, well, let's see, to young artists, of will be specific to thinking about them for a moment. Um, I have, I, my friends know this well, I have a motto, uh, hanging in my studio, I look at it every day, and it says, what do I need to do to earn the respect of this material? And until I can answer that question, I will not move forward. And what, what that answer entails varies, of course, for all of us. But what I want, I guess I would want young artists, if that's useful to them, to think about what does earning it mean for them? today? Is it, is it through labor, actual work hours, or digging deeper, or uh, broadening the conversation, uh, the sources you're working from? Or as Ashana also beautifully stated, which I, I wanted to make a note of, uh, that I don't think is a skill set always, you know, emphasized to young artists, is that maybe your idea needs you to change. What sh the, the strategy of uh, the medium you're choosing and why that really you know, resonated with me is because you know, I'm a sculptor, I'm a sound artist, I've recently moved into film, I'm writing a book. But the reason I'm doing that is because the idea asks something different of me each time. And that becomes a type of skill. Like, are you, are you listening to the idea? And does it always have to be solved through, you know, painting's beautiful, it has a beautiful toolbox of things to pull from. But is painting, for example, always the right solution? Mm -hmm. And to just have that conversation, and it's a conversation that I love, and you know, 25 years in as an artist, I'm proud of the varieties of ways I've solved it. So I will leave the students with, with those thoughts. All right, and we're gonna go to Ashan or Dr. Crawley in a second, but I wanna throw this, I call it for me, it's a scripture, um, but it's a quote. And whenever I think of your work, brother, this is what reminds me of. It's James Baldwin from The Fire Next Time. Perhaps we were, all of us, pimps, whores, racketeers, church members, and children, bound together by the nature of our oppression, the specific and peculiar complex of risk that we had run. 
If so, within these limits, we sometimes achieved with each other a freedom that was close to love. I remember anyway, church suppers and outings, and later, after I left the church, rent and waistline parties where rage and sorrow sat in the darkness and did not stir. And we ate and drank and talked and laughed and danced and forgot about the man. Uh -huh. Amen. Amen. Give us the last word. You're the benediction, my brother Crawley. So go ahead and, and, and give it to us. People really want me to still be a preacher. I ain't no <laughs> uh, I will say that yeah. the thing that Baldwin said in that quote about constraint and the thing that you make in constraint um, is the thing that I'm constantly trying to think about. You know, there is this way that blackness for a whole bunch of people including a whole bunch of artists is seen as a constraint that they want to like release themselves from. I want to be released from the constraint of my blackness in order to be a real full human. And I'm like, I don't care about that. Like constrain me in the beauty of blackness as much as possible. Put me in the constraint of queerness because beauty is made there and, and joy is made there. And Baldwin's like, yeah, it's in the church when you're eating dinner with folks after church and sometimes it's at the rent party. Sometimes it's when you're drinking. But that constraint itself is not something we have to we have to on the one hand abolish the ways constraints are produced against us while at the same time recognizing that we produce beauty in constraint and so at the same time that we fight against the systems of oppression <clears throat> that constrain us we have to recognize the beauty that we are producing as our fight against the constraint <laughs> it's this beautiful thing and so for me um what I constantly want to do and how I constantly want to think with other people is, is trying to think through the ways we make things, um, the way we make beauty, the, maybe, the way we make sound, the way we make love in constraint. Oh, and last thing I'll say is, I don't think nobody's straight. And I know that's a problem, but <laughs> I'm working on it in my next book. <laughs> because I think, I think if we pay attention to Black musicianship and musicianship in the 80s, with Hammond musicians and the AIDS pandemic and the, and the crisis of loss that black churches endured um, and never spoke about, um, we can get a sense for the problem with the concepts of Western notions for sexual orientation are such a problem. And that one of the places where we can find different modalities of experimentation is in a place like a black Pentecostal church where people are practicing different, I'm not saying good, but they are practicing different modalities for relationship and sometimes they're joyful and sometimes they're deeply painful. And so trying to think about those constraints um, and the beauty that's made there without ever talking, without ever giving up or refusing to talk about the, the pain that is produced in those constraints, I think is really important, excuse me, and necessary. So thank you all. Benediction is constrain me in the beauty of blackness. Mm. That, 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 don't, don't be mad if you see me one day, bro. I'm, I'm running with that whole constrain me in the beauty, beauty of blackness thing. I'm telling you right now, don't be like he was biting my stuff. Just understand you put it out there into the world and it has come into my spirit and I'm going to roll with it, all right? But constraining me in the beauty of blackness. Uh, my name is Dr. Daniel Walker and I want to first off thank all of our amazing artists, um, Dario Robledo, um, Sean Crawley, uh, uh, Fo or Fola Yemi uh, Wilson, and Nathan, excuse me, Norman Teague for bringing their art, for bringing their spirit, for bringing their story, for bringing their testimony, for bringing their pain, for bringing their joy, for bringing all that stuff to this space. And I want to also give it up to Jasmine McNeil and to Kara Lewis. Come on, y'all. Without vision come on the people perish right and this notion of being able to have this vision of first a space that is here to interrogate examine celebrate you name it this intersection of our spirit and secular world from an artistic standpoint and using multi uh media but also then this specific exhibit to 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 center it in the notion of it, it in the old school world, this would have been antithetical to talk about black Pentecostalism and talk about the art world. I mean, that way, right, <laughs> somebody, somebody say that those are almost the two widest ranging chasm that you could see 
in the world, but you chose to push forward and to do this. So to Kara Lewis and everyone here at Bridge Projects Museum, to Jasmine McNeil, a young sister who was working her thing out to carve a new space and to, you know, blaze her own trail in this art world. I thank you all. Please come down. The exhibit lasts all the way till June 26th. If you check on the website right now for Bridge Projects, there's a number of other um, amazing lectures, uh, talks, and things that are going on. And you've got to get down here and see this stuff that is here because it will blow your mind. Um, as, as my great friend, and not really friend, never knew him, but you know what I mean? Marvin Gaye would say, you know, if the spirit moves you, what? Let me groove you, right? So come on down here. Let the spirit move you. Let it groove you. I'm Dr. Daniel Walker. This is Bridge Projects. And it's back over to you, Kara. Right on.